Estimating static stability, that's a very important weather skill. If the stability is low, we can get gusty winds, turbulence, dust storms, and even thunderstorms. Now for the purposes of this quick tutorial, I'm going to use UCAR weather. That's U-C-A-R weather. You can just put that into a search engine and you'll come up with this upper air page. And these are a little bit better than what we have on sites like Pivotal Weather and the Sharpie tools because we only get four sets of lines for whatever reason. We've got pressure, which is straight horizontal. That corresponds to altitude. We get the dry D bats, which are slightly curved and they go pretty far over to the left with height. We've got the mixing ratio, which is a measure of moisture. Those are straight and they go slightly up and to the right. And we've got temperature, which is straight and occupies the entire chart, sloping up and to the right. Well, one is missing. And to really dig into this, we need to have all five lines. Well, this is what we get on UCAR. We got pressure, we have the dry bats, that's these dashed red lines. We've got the mixing ratio lines, kind of hard to see them, but they're yellowish and they go like that. Typically we only find that at the bottom of the chart. And we've got the temperature lines, that's these gray straight lines. So the missing line, that's going to be these dashed green lines that we see right here. And those are very important for assessing static stability. So we're going to try this site up here in Manitoba. That's the SKU-T diagram from this morning. The temperature line over here and the moisture line on the left. And we're going to focus exclusively on this line right here. Now you notice it has some very strong differences Below this line, it slopes up and to the right. Above that, it slopes up and to the left. And what we're seeing here is differences in the static stability of these layers. The bottom layer is statically stable, very much so. This is basically an inversion. And we know that that layer has very high static stability because the slope is to the right of these green lines. In other words, we want a slope that's like that, like that, like that, and so on. Something like that. And this is clearly a lot like that example. On the other hand, the southern line, well, that slopes more like that. So that's going to be statically unstable. Now we have one more line to contend with for these unstable lines, and that's these dashed red lines called dry eddy bats. Now what we do is evaluate the line with respect to the red and green lines. So that's going to be that one there and that one there. We can see that that slope is in between. And that's what we call conditionally unstable. Now if it slopes way over to the left, to the left of the dry eddy bat, that's what we call absolutely unstable. And that's extremely rare because it immediately overturns if it's in that condition. So we should never see that on a skew T diagram. If we do see it, that usually means instrumentation error and artifacts such as evaporational cooling leaving a cloud layer. So for all intents and purposes, you just evaluate the line with respect to the green line. Well, it's going to be probably different colors on other sites, but you'll recognize the shape of these. They stand pretty much up and they slope slightly to the left. And that's going to be your moist eddy bats. And whenever your lines are to the left of that, unstable, almost always conditionally unstable. And when it's to the right of that, like that, that's indicating stability. And that's really all you need to know. So here we have a stable layer, here we have a conditionally unstable layer, and then above that, we find this on almost every SKU-T, 
it's usually either stable or pretty close to neutral, and that marks the stratosphere. And the transition zone right there, that's going to be the tropopause. And of course, that is the top of the troposphere. And that's really about all there is to it. No need to make that any more complex than it is. So study that and check out some of the SKUTs online. Now we do use Pivotal Weather quite a bit, so we don't have the benefit of those moist eddy bats. You know, I don't see them here. On some charts, they'll paint the lifted parcel in a white color. That white line always is the moist adiabat. So you can just kind of look at the line with respect to that, and we can see that that layer right there is neutral. And a lot of times the inversions are self-evident, like this one right here off the Pacific coast. That's going to be the marine layer beneath a low-level inversion. So that's your morsel of weather knowledge for today. Looking at the surface analysis this afternoon, we've got some cold air in different parts of the country. One large chunk in the Pacific Northwest up here, you can see Seattle is pretty close to 50 degrees. That's a huge change from three months ago when they were just getting roasted. 56 at Portland, and even in the northern California San Joaquin Valley where hundreds are common, only 67 this afternoon. And that's due to this polar front extending from Saskatchewan down to Reno and down towards Los Angeles. Lots of packing of these red thickness lines indicates cooler air filtering down. And the core of the polar air is up off the Washington coast. In the central U.S., doesn't look like very much a couple frontal systems, but once again, looking at that thickness line, we find this little bullseye right here, and that's a pocket of cold air in the mid-levels, and probably to a certain extent in the low levels. And the result of that, that's going to be a cold core low spiraling around in the Ozarks. And we've got this northerly flow in Texas, a very high temperature dew point spread, and that's given us some very high cumulus bases. That cumulus that you saw in the opening clip is up there at 7,000 feet. And I think that's probably some of the highest cumulus that we've ever seen in this part of the country, even compared to summertime. Those heights are very common in the western U.S., but we just don't see those here in the northeast Texas region. And a, another chunk of cold air across the northeastern U.S. This is a baroclinic high feeding some cold air across the Great Lakes and the Appalachians into these other systems further to the southwest. The turbulent winter weather continues in Alaska. Seems like summer just shut down early back in early September, and they've fallen into the 40s, 30s, and 20s. We've got what looks like a warm occlusion, and that's due to the occluded front kind of following the orientation of the warm front. That's indicative of colder air out ahead of it and slightly warmer air back behind it. And you can see that there is some warmer air aloft, bringing the thickness values down and creating this thickness ridge that extends up into the McGrath area. 20s out there around Fairbanks, a very cold morning. 29 out there in the Brooks Range and 31 a little bit warmer up in the Arctic Ocean region. And there's how it looks in eastern Canada. I know a lot of viewers probably don't care about this, so we're not going to spend too much time on it. But uh, very wound up barotropic low. This is an old dead occlusion around Iqaluit. And back behind it, northwesterly flow bringing cold air across Quebec and Labrador. And it seems like only a few weeks ago, we were seeing 80s and 90s up there around Goose Bay. So quite a change there as well. 
Now, this is the time of year when we need to start becoming concerned with atmospheric rivers. These are conduits of very high moisture values coming from the tropics, places like these areas here. Now, if you want to see an example, watch this area right here feeding up into Southern California. We start out this morning and running the maps forward, you can see a plume coming up towards San Diego. And that's a substantial amount of moisture. That purple indicates one and a half inch precipitable water amounts, which is a lot of moisture for a dynamic weather system to work with. And that moisture goes all the way up to Las Vegas, western Arizona, so precipitation chances should be going up in those areas. Now, UCSD, they have a very good IVT map that's that IVT integrated vapor transport. That's what we use to measure the strength of the atmospheric rivers. Values of about 250, those are going to be weak. Once we get up to 500, we're getting into the moderate range, 750 strong, and then the extreme values are up there. So we're going to look at that region along the Southern California coast. And there's that river starting up, feeding right into the San Diego area. And that appears to be about 500, so maybe a few specks of 6 and 700. So that's pretty strong for this time of year. Now another area to watch is Texas. We start out with dry conditions, generally below 1 inch precipitable water. But around Saturday... Well, here comes some moisture. Southerly flow picks up and we feed one and a half inch precipitable water amounts into this next system coming through Oklahoma around Sunday. And very likely with that much moisture, with that much forcing, we're probably going to see the development of an MCS in the Great Plains. That moves on off to the east, and you can see another surge coming up into Texas around midweek. That'll interact with the next weather system, and you can see the very depressed pressure values out there in the Rockies, and the very high pressure values up in the northwest. So something is really coming together in this area here. And we've got the moisture lined up out ahead of it. Good ingredients coming together, and there it goes moving out into the Great Plains around Tuesday night or Wednesday. That's another potential MCS. Some strong drying behind that front. And a possible winter weather system. Of course, I don't have any idea what the temperatures are up there, but this time of year, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, that strong wraparound, and the cold temperatures coming in the backside of that system, that could combine to produce some wintry weather. Any other atmospheric river possibilities? Well, there's one here around the following weekend, around the 17th. So stormy on the west coast. Well, speaking of storms, we better check out the National Hurricane Center. Possible system coming together off the North Carolina coast over the next few days. So we have to keep an eye on that. And here it is on the GFS chart. A little bit of a tropical depression, possibly off the coast. Kind of wandering around out there, but not really doing very much, except right along the coastal regions. And then it gets picked up by the prevailing westerlies, kind of shears out there. And looks like the low hangs on for a while, but not very much development. So our attention focuses to the western U.S. Let's run that back. You can see one system moving across the Rockies on the weekend. That's it right there. You can tell by the extensive precipitation, not much of a reflection at the surface, but it's certainly there. And looking at the thickness, the red lines, probably a setup kind of like that. Moving past the weekend, a little bit of cold air comes into the southern Rockies, and then we get some development on the west coast, a new recharge of that cold air. 
snow showers in the mountainous areas of the northwest, and even a bit of a snowstorm there in some areas. That looks pretty wound up there. This is Tuesday next week, so very likely this is going to be within, just barely within the range of accuracy of the models. So it certainly points to a turbulent system coming together there in the central Rockies. And strong cold front through New Mexico, Arizona, warm front like that, and cold air advection filtering throughout the entire length of the Rockies in the U.S. And on the forward side, moisture flowing north. And we just talked about that moisture, and very likely we're going to see the, the dry line set up. Well, no, that's not what I want. I haven't used the dry line keys in so long, I forgot which key it is. Uh, well, anyway, yeah, that dry line is going to be somewhere in there. The system comes out into the plains, not much of an eastward push. Most of the momentum goes to the northeast. Triple point up there in South Dakota. So the warm wedge heading pretty far north and most of the dynamics running like that. Eventually some of it will make it into Texas. And there goes the departing weather system up into Canada. And just this meager front coming out into the Mississippi River Valley and Great Lakes. Some cold air eventually comes down, but we can see due to the westerly gradient, most of that cold air heading for the Great Lakes. Some of it will make it into Texas. You can see a kind of a weak northerly flow right there. But it's not going to be a big dramatic push of cold air. I want to thank our new Patreon supporters, Michael Rose, Joseph Fulton, and Philip Slack. Thank you for helping to make this program possible. And we'll see everybody back here on Friday. Have a great Wednesday night, and we'll see you in a couple days. Bye-bye.